Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Great. My name is Chris Kleban, and together with Justin Lawyer, we are product managers on Google Cloud, and we'll be talking to you about machine learning on GCP. So I'm a very transparent person, and I'm going to make it very clear what I hope your takeaways are from this talk. One, I want you to be really excited about what you could do with machine learning. Two, I want you to feel confident that your organization can successfully implement machine learning with Google Cloud. And three, <coughs> I want you to trust that with Google AI's focus, that we are the right platform and partner for your ML workloads. Three takeaways. And this is what we're going to be talking about for you to get those takeaways. Before we dig into it, I just want to say thank you. We all have limited time with our busy lives. You've chosen to come to Google Cloud, our next conference, and this session. So just thank you. So what can ML do for you? It could do a lot of amazing things. If your organization has any competition, I guarantee they're looking at ML. Now, ML is not necessarily for invent inventing the insane. If you're in transportation, it's not about how are we going to create teleportation. It's about taking your existing businesses and processes and being able to reimagine and reinvent what you're doing today. There's three kind of big areas that ML could help with. It could help you get insights or your customers. It could help you innovate your products and help with automation. Let's look at automation real quick. Self-driving trucks and cars. Right? Taking the businesses that everyone's doing today with transportation and cabs and making it faster and cheaper and easier and safer. Let's look at innovation. One of our customers, Disney, uses our product, AutoML, to innovate their retail service. They wanted their user experience to be really quick to find the product they're looking for. So they used a web interface to create a custom model, no ML expertise needed, and now in their search experience, you could type Mickey Mouse on the beach, and it finds all the products related to the beach and Mickey Mouse. Really cool, really easy. And insights. Let's say you're a plane manufacturer, an airline, and you really care about safety. Thanks to IoT, there's tons of data that these instruments are doing. And what if you collect that data? What if you process it? And what if you could predict that maybe there's a part on the plane that needs maintenance before it's regularly scheduled? Insights for safety. So feel excited about what your organization can do. So show of hands, who here, their organization, is looking into machine learning today? Great. One more show of hands. Who here thinks they understand what machine learning is? OK, about half of you. Last question. Who knows what a machine learning model is? OK, most of you. So I'll just touch over this really briefly. Machine learning is about data and taking data and getting insights and action. There's all kinds of data out there, images, unstructured text, relational databases, sequence information. And what machine learning is is taking that data, taking an ML algorithm of various sorts, and passing through that data through that alg algorithm with a huge set of infrastructure. And as you pass that data through, the machine learning model is created. And this model gets better and better. The more data, the better algorithms, the more infrastructure. And you use that model to create insights, automation, and innovation. So we, we all know this service, web search. Google's been an AI company and a data company for 18 years now, collecting the world's data, making it accessible and usable by all. And we have a lot of expertise in this area, large-scale data centers, AI experts, data experts. And what Google Cloud is is about bringing that expertise to you with ML. And this is a nice little story about how we internally have implemented ML successfully. Our internal AI team called Brain, they create ML models, take a bunch of data through an algorithm, pass it through a huge scale of infrastructure, and create ML models. But not every single software developer at Google is an ML expert. 
So what we've done is we went around to our software developers and trained them. Here's how you can implement ML with these existing models. So what this graph is showing is the number of source code repositories that our developers are using the Brain's ML model to implement successfully AI into internal services, external products. And we're bringing these types of concepts to Google Cloud. On the right, you'll see a bunch of products that have integrated ML and AI. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'll talk about two of my favorites. So I'm a father. I have three kids. And I take a lot of digital photos of my kids, a ridiculous amount, maybe 100,000 in total. And I had this Mac, and I had some hard drives, and I was worried about storage. So I got Google Photos, free unlimited storage. Well, that's great. It's cheap. It's scalable. I don't got to worry about backing things up. But really, the innovation was the search feature. It has facial recognition and knows who my kids are. I can click on a picture of my face and my phone, type in a word like a beach or a boat, and now it goes through 100,000 photos and finds the exact photo I'm looking for. In the past, that would have taken me 20 minutes to find. ML is innovating, and so could you. So no matter what size your organization is, no matter what type of technical staff, there's different ways to implement ML. And we're going to be talking about both ways. The first way is to use our ML models. You don't need to be an ML expert. You just need to be a software developer, or your organization does. Any programming language with the REST API is simple to use. If you're a CXO out there or executive trying to decide, do I fund a project? It's very low risk to take a high quality model, have a software developer use an API and implement it. Get started really quickly. And the other route is to build the custom model. Maybe you're a domain expert in your space, or you have access to the data, and you want to create your own ML model. So we have a bunch of tools for experts, a bunch of hardware to get you fast and cheap ML processing. And this is where I'm going to hand it off to Justin. And he's going to talk about these in a little bit more detail. Thanks, Chris. So thanks very much for coming. Today, we're going to talk about how do you find the right tools for your job as a, an expert in your field. So first of all is, as Chris was mentioning, um, Google has created a lot of machine learning models for specific applications to power Google applications. And so we then have wrapped REST APIs around these for you to consume. Um, we call these the perception APIs because they're typically around human perception and how the user interacts with the application. Um, so quickly going on to the next slide here. Um, there are three main categories of these APIs. One is for regarding site, the other is around conversation, and the third one is around language. Um, I think it's important to maybe walk through each of these really quickly so you can kind of understand out-of-the-box capabilities that you can get without you doing any coding other than using a REST API, and then implement that into your application. So first of all, for site, Say you've got an, uh, an image, and you want to understand what's in that image automatically. You pass that image to the Vision API, and you can understand what the objects are within that image automatically, and you can figure out where the faces are, and it can tell different people. For the video understanding API, you can pass it the video, and it can tell scene transitions, different objects within that video. You can basically search and find what you're looking for within the video, or across videos if you're passing multiple videos. OCR, often um, people have documents that they've scanned, and you need to kind of understand what the heck is in that document. Maybe it's a PDF, maybe it's a GIF, whatever it is. You need to be able to, not a GIF, a JPEG, you might pass it into the API, and then it will automatically detect what are the, what are the, the words in that document and give you that raw text afterwards. Um, or maybe you've got an image of a scene, and there's signs on the wall. It'll give you the, the text of what's on that sign. Um, so the OCR is really, really handy in, um, in everyday applications. The adult content one is actually one really, really important, because you might get user-submitted content. You don't know what's in that image. You need to make sure that you're not pre presenting an inappropriate image to your users. So the adult content is a, uh, detection is a really easy way for you to detect you know, what's going on in that image, and is it something that you should filter out for your users. Um, for the conversation class of APIs, the audio to text, you might have a streaming um, audio file that you then need to figure out what is being said. It will then transcribe that event and give it to you. It's useful for videos, for real conversations with people, for TV shows, whatever it might be. 
The reverse is also possible. You might have a text string that you need to read out to your user. Well, you pass um, the, the, the string to the, the application, and it will then create the, the synthetic voice that you can then read off to your user. Um, chatbots um, is a way for you to engage with your users and program the interactions you would like in chat directly with your user and program certain kinds of conversations to go on and help them with customer service calls or things like that. From the language APIs, um, one of the things that's really hard is if you've got freeform text, what the heck is it really saying? We will map out and figure out the, the context of what it's saying, map out the, the data structure of the sentences, give you the parts of speech so you can figure out, OK, what are the nouns, what are the verbs, what are the relationships of these, and then you can do something intelligent with that structure. Sentiment analysis is a situation where what's the mood that's being transmitted along with those words? What we've had is we've seen a lot of good success trying to monitor, for instance, the sentiment of customer service emails or chats, and when things are getting out of hand, being able to escalate that to managers so you can kind of make sure things don't spiral out of control. Or if you need to understand if something's aggressive or calm or happy, how do you kind of make sure you're categorizing things appropriately if you're like rating customer service calls, things like that. In translation, it's a great way to just automatically translate from one language to the other, and we'll talk a little bit about that next as an example. So for instance, say you are a game developer and you have an online community, and, and they're, but they're coming from all over the world speaking different languages. You want them to be able to talk to each other. In real-time chat, you can basically have the ability to translate to any of the other languages. So the Translate API makes that really easy. Or you might be able to get inbound customer service emails and be able to translate that to a language that your customer service rep understands so that they can then find the right article to respond to your customer. So the, the nice thing about these APIs is they're basically just REST APIs. You basically, we give you a snippet of code. You pop it into your, your app. The only thing you really have to change is the key and the URI to point to your data, and voila, off you go. Can't really get any simpler than that. The, the other nice thing about this is, well, the, the next question that comes up is, well, what about performance? How well do these actually work? They work really great for common use cases. For some cases, you might have a problem that Google's never had to deal with. Or you might have to deal with a situation that, with a lot more detail than Google has to deal with. For instance, Google would probably tell the difference between a bolt and a, and a nail really easily. But if, say, let's say you're a manufacturer, and there, you've got 2,000 different bolts on your production line. How do you tell the difference between these for your parts? Well, what we have enabled is uh, Cloud AutoML, so that you can prov provide images of all of your parts labeled. And we may not be able to distinguish them unless you give the labels. We then train a model for you. Uh, the, then you get a REST API endpoint that you can then use in your application. So the nice thing about that is it's really easy to use. And you don't have to know machine learning. We do it for you. But then you can use it in your application. So the next question is, well, how well does this work? Um, it actually works better than all the open source uh, models out there. And so you get a great performing model, and it's really easy to use. So it's been really helpful. So, the, so that's actually one category of way to use ML. Another way is, um, let's say I've got data scientists, and I want to build my own model because I've got my own data, and it's a custom problem that I need to deal with. Well, there's two different ways to do this. One is using the cloud managed services. And these are services where you don't want to deal with the infrastructure. We'll deal with that for you. That way, you can focus on your machine learning processes. So we've got Dataproc and Dataflow, so you can deal with your pre-processing. Dataproc is essentially Hadoop and Spark, but managed. Or Dataflow is using Beam in the back end. From a machine learning processing perspective, machine, uh, ML Engine, or Machine Learning Engine, allows you to automatically spin up the infrastructure, and we'll get to that in a little bit, and then tear it down when you're done. So it, makes the, it takes the infrastructure pain away from the data scientists. It supports all the top frameworks. And we've got Data Lab, which is a managed notebook, which allows you to make the, the data exploration easier. So first, about Data Lab. How many of you out there have actually used Jupyter Notebook or know about Jupyter Notebooks? So probably about a third of you or a half. So just for the rest of you, so you understand what Jupyter Notebook is. It's essentially an app where you can, supply a, you can point it to your data and supply some code to be able to analyze your data, visualize the data, push return, see it immediately, 
get some feedback, and then iterate on that and keep iterating, keep adding it to it. You can replay the entire notebook. You can just play certain snippets of that. You can share it with your coworkers. So it's a really great way to explore, visualize, and prototype. So it's a fantastic tool. The nice thing about Data Lab is it's pre-configured to connect to all the different cloud services like BigQuery, ML Engine, et cetera. So it's really easy to just work off of the cloud. You can also use it locally on your laptop. Machine Learning Engine um, is really a great way to do distributed learning on any arbitrary data site for your data using all the top frameworks. And again, it's, it's a managed service, so you just point it at your model and your data, and you just spin it up. It takes care of all the distributed training for you. You don't have to worry about it. it terminates, tears everything down, and so you only pay for what you use. So it's a really efficient way to do this. You don't have to worry about accidentally leaving that VM on and you're getting charged for a month's worth of notice when you get the bill. The other nice thing about this is it also does batch prediction and online prediction. So basically, you can spin up these, these batch prediction jobs really efficiently. Or for online prediction, it'll create the REST API endpoint for you, for your model, and serve to whatever volumes you need for any, set of, any number of apps that you've got. So it's a great way to manage your apps in a, in a really easy way. Um, the other thing is we found that data scientists often don't do optimization of their models because it's kind of a pain. You have to you know, vary all the different parameters and find the right configuration for your data set. Well, we've built that into ML Engine, so it actually makes it really simple for you. You just give the parameters, and it will then go find the optimal model. So instead of finding just a good enough model, you're actually finding the best one for your, for your data set. So it really improves your performance of your models. So putting it all together from a managed perspective, We've got different services to, for every step of the entire ML lifecycle that you might have to deal with for an application. We've got the ingestion side, the pre-processing side, storage in the exploring and experimentation, the, the visualization side, training and serving your models, or to be able to create reports using Data Studio. All of it on our managed service, so you don't have to deal with the infrastructure. You don't have to have an SRE managing all of those pagers. The other way to do this is doing it all yourself and rolling your own solution. There's actually some very valid reasons why some customers would want to do this. You might be a researcher, and you want to be able to make um, changes to any part of the stack you want. It might be that you've got a very custom pipeline, or it could be that you want cutting edge open source software to plunk in at any point you want. There's lots of different reasons you might want to do that. That's completely OK. We, we love users like that. You might also have a hybrid. Um, implementation where some stuff is on the cloud and some stuff is on-prem. That's a very common use case. We want to support that. So doing it yourself and having a, a way to, to deploy that is really important. So the exact same infrastructure that we had before, which is managed, the same kinds of open source platforms are available for you to roll automatically on your own infrastructure. You manage it. And you get the exact same hardware that's powering the other solutions. So we also make it really easy to get started with deep learning. You know, as deep learning has really been taking off as a really great way to find the insights in complex data sets. And we provide a, a VM image that's been certified and optimized to work on GCE. So out of the box, you get a Jupyter Notebook. You get access to all the hardware that Chris is going to talk about in a moment. And it's configured to get you the best results possible. So with one click, you can deploy this onto the machine of your choice, getting access to any accelerators that you want, and off you go. It's in instant, ready to go. You know, we mentioned about the, the, the commitment that Google has to the open source community. Kubeflow is a, an open source project that I love. It started last fall as a way to, on Kubernetes, be able to create microservices for specific ML jobs like distributed training or distributed uh, serving of different kinds of models anywhere you want, whether it's on GCP or on-prem. So this is a highly portable way to deploy these containers everywhere you want. And that way, your, your deployments are consistent from GCP or on-prem, and you don't have to worry about the resource matching because Kubernetes takes care of that. It's a Kubernetes native way of handling all of that. Um, and again, it's, it's configured to work on CPU, GPU, and TPU on, on GCE, on-prem, you get access to whatever you have internally. Um, so how that might look if you deploy that on GCE would be you would, you would create your GK, GKE cluster, which is a managed Kubernetes cluster on, G, on GCP. You would then be able to spin up your Jupyter Hub notebooks, 
spin up your TensorFlow training um, uh, service or you know, any other framework that you wanted to put, and then do the same thing for your TensorFlow serving, it would all have access to your shared storage on GCP, natural to Kubernetes. So it's a great way to actually do this in a very portable manner. That entire container in, can then be deployed anywhere you want, and it's a, it's a fantastic solution. So now I'm going to pass the time on to Chris, who's going to talk about hardware. Thank you, Justin. So going back to the takeaways, being excited about ML, feeling confident that you can implement ML in Google Cloud, and Google's AI focus makes us the right partner for your ML workloads. Let's talk about that really quickly. Just to, to re reiterate some of these things. Right? If you're a developer and you want to implement ML, you don't need to be an ML expert. Use our API models. Get started right away. Low risk. If those pre-trained ML models aren't to your liking or you need to do something custom, use a web browser with auto ML to create custom ML models. It's amazing, super simple. And if you are a data expert or a machine learning scientist or a domain expert, we have the great tools for your workloads as well. You can successfully implement ML on Google Cloud. But let's talk about compute and infrastructure briefly and how it relates to ML. 80% of the recent AI improvements and advances have been attributed to more available compute power. But at a recent TensorFlow event, a survey has found that people admit not having access to enough compute for their ML research. That's a clear problem. So let's go back a few decades. Because all of us in this room working on ML were standing on the shoulders of giants. Neural networks and this concept of how ML works, it's decades old. Taking a look at the human brain and how neurons are connected to each other and how by passing one information from one neuron to another, it's an old concept. But it's the recent implementation of large-scale data centers and hardware accelerators that have able, enabled us to make these big neural networks and advances in ML. So the infrastructure matters. And why it matters is no matter which path you take, building custom models, using Google ML models, it's that infrastructure that's holding it up. In our models, we've already taken the data, passed it through great algorithms, and passed it through this infrastructure, large-scale, football-sized field data centers, over and over again to make these models better and better. We're going to keep doing that. And we, with the Google Cloud, we're giving you access to that same scale, that same power to do it yourself, and do it affordably. One of our new ML customers on GCP is OpenAI. And talk about large scale. They went the unmanaged route. They're a domain expert. They're an AI thought leader. And they're a nonprofit organization working on innovating with AI and making it open and safe. They use 100,000 and more processors to do reinforcement learning. They're using thousands of GPUs to do machine learning. It's that access to scale that is enabling, enabling them to innovate, and it's Google Cloud that's providing it for them. Hardware accelerators are so important, and just hardware innovation. With CPUs, we have Skylake. But for ML workloads, we also need for distributed training and large training jobs, we need parallelized compute power. So we have, th historically, since February 2017, we've launched three NVIDIA GPU models, the K80, P100, V100. It's high performance pass-through PCI. With, N with the V100, we have NVLink interconnections. Right? S super great for ML workloads. The one thing that we make it a little different than some of our competitors is how we offer custom VMs. Take any amount of CPU, any amount of memory, whatever GPU type you have, any number of GPUs, create a VM, use network attack storage, or if you want fast disk I.O. for a certain workload, attach in-server SSD, and just pay for what you want. Or if you have a bottleneck, adjust one of those. Some of our other competitors don't offer that flexibility. And so you're going to save money, and your ML jobs are going to go faster. Actually, going back one, this week, we also launched the P4 GPU. Brand new, it's coming out in a week. 
It's great for ML inference workloads. So we're going to keep working with our partner, NVIDIA, to launch new GPUs. So we don't just stop there, right? AI focus in Google. We have the TPU line, right? We made Cloud V2 TPU available last year. It's an ASIC purposely built for machine learning. And today, we've made some new announcements. V3 coming out, faster, cheaper ML workloads. There's the TPU pod, which is a series of TPUs connected with a fast network. So again, Google's AI focus is building infrastructure. We're training these ML models quicker. And we're also offering it to you. You should trust that we're the right partner for your ML workloads. Savings is a lot of money, a, a, a big, big deal for a lot of companies. There's an assistant professor in Stanford who has a budget, does some research in ML, and he has a fixed, you know, only so much he could do. So there's a win-win product at the unman unmanaged route, preemptible VMs and preemptible GPUs and TPUs. Sometimes we have some spare capacity. And ML batch workloads like training and inference, it's, we offer 70% off GPUs and TPUs, and announced this morning we lowered the prices of TPUs. So now this researcher could use our spare capacity, get some savings, run a batch workload. It's not for all use cases, because the capacity isn't guaranteed. It's not always there. But if you're a researcher and you need to do some work, or a big organization that just needs batch workloads once in a while, it's a great way to do more innovation with less money. Data is really important with ML. Google has a great fiber network, great internet connections. So if you're moving your data large chunks in, we have it handled. If you have a large, uh, uh, real-time incoming flow of data through various sources, right? We have cloud locations all over the world. If you need to ship us some data, we have an appliance we can get you to ship large amount. It's not just compute. It's not just the great AI services. It's the network. It's the security. It's everything built in there. So we talked about a lot of AI services. We've given you an overview and an intro. We talked about how ML is not about inventing the impossible. It's about reimagining and reinventing what you're doing today. There's over 14,000 customers doing ML on GCP today. So with our focus on open and hybrid and multi-cloud workloads, our focus on hardware, our new services that we're announcing, and the keynotes you mentioned, new auto ML services, high quality APIs. It doesn't matter how you want to do it. You should feel excited that you can do it. You should feel confident that you can successfully do it. And Google's the right partner for you. There's a bunch of ways you can learn more, get started, get built. <clears throat> One I will call out specifically that I, I personally use was Kaggle. Kaggle is an ML competition service and community. When I was learning ML, I joined. Didn't know what I was doing, right? And there was an image recognition competition where drivers were either paying attention to the road or feeling distracted. So I joined the community. I joined the ML challenge. They had a lot of resources about how to use TensorFlow and how to pre-process the data. And Google is using Kaggle to help the people in the world learn ML. And you, too, could use it. Or if you're an organization and a bunch of data set, you could start a competition and have the world's ML experts do ML for you. There's a bunch of resources on how to learn about these services. There's free credits if you're not a Google Cloud customer already. So with that, we wanted to thank you. Our time is almost up. We're going to do some Q&A. So there's two mics on either side. And uh, just ask some questions. Thank you. <laughs>